welcome you to another edition of Being Well Informed. My name is Claudia Barber, and I am your host on this fine afternoon, and we are delighted to have in our presence today, Lay Purvis from AARP. Hello. Hi there. How are you doing? I'm doing well, thank you. So delighted that you joined us this uh, uh, day to talk about the Inflation Reduction Act, because there's been a lot of discussion and a lot of active involvement from AARP. Lay Purvis, tell us who you are and uh, a little bit more about the Inflation Reduction Act and its impact on older Americans. Absolutely. So my name is Lee Purvis, and I am part of AERP's Public Policy Institute, where I am a director. And I help lead a team of people who work on health policy issues that AERP works on. And my little part of that world is prescription drug issues. So I've been working on prescription drug pricing and coverage for a very long time now. Um, and so I, of course, was extremely excited to see the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act, which just happened about a month ago, um, because it includes a lot of really important provisions that address high prescription drug prices, and they're going to make them hopefully a lot more affordable for the older Americans that AERP represents. So a lot of people were uh, really excited about the Inflation Reduction Act. And what is in it that is so significant for AARP members and people that are just beyond the 50 age? So there's a whole lot in there. And I will try to go through it kind of in the order in which it's going to be implemented, because I think that helps people kind of wrap their heads around it a little bit easier. Um, so, for example, starting this year, drug companies are going to start to face penalties if they increase their prices faster than inflation. And for anyone who's taking prescription drugs, you probably are aware that a lot of drug companies increase their prices year after year, and oftentimes at rates that greatly exceed inflation. So the hope is that these penalties will discourage drug companies from taking kind of what we refer to as those relentless price hikes. So when do the penalties take place? Is it immediate, automatic, uh, next year, when? So there's two parts of the Medicare program that are affected by these penalties. One part, Medicare Part D is in DOG, which covers prescription drugs that you pick up at the pharmacy. That penalty program is going to start phasing in at the end of this year. And then the second part of Medicare that's affected, which is Medicare Part B is in BOY, which covers prescription drugs that you get at a doctor's office. Um, that will start phasing in next year. So starting very soon, drug companies will be facing those penalties that, again, hopefully will discourage them from taking those big price increases year after year. Well, that's that's really important for people to pay attention to. Now, a lot of people take things for granted, such as prescription drug pricing. So can you give us an example like insulin or diabetes medication that is impacted by this Inflation Reduction Act legislation? Yeah, it really affects pretty much all of the drugs that people are taking that are causing those affordability problems because it really does address those brand name drug prices. And those are the drugs that tend to come with those three, four, even five figure price tags, sometimes even six figure. Um, they can be remarkably expensive. And the legislation, the Inflation Reduction Act is intended to address those prices. Part of it is to stop those prices from increasing as quickly as they have, where you can have drugs like insulin, for example, that have been around for almost 100 years um, that have increased 100 percentage wise. Um, it's it's incredible how much those prices have increased in a very short period of time, and it's really caused some affordability problems. Um, the hope is that the Inflation Reduction Act will stop those price increases that have gotten the prices to the point where they are now. But another really important provision in the Inflation Reduction Act is allowing Medicare to negotiate with drug companies, which is something that it has been prohibited from doing. Um, they will now have the opportunity to negotiate with drug companies to try to get those prices down. And so between addressing those price increases and those high prices, um, through negotiation, the hope is that we will be able to get prescription drug prices that are much more affordable for the people who need them. When you think about the fact that uh, people often have to take insulin every day, and it's, it's one of those drugs that you can't skip, 
And uh, then uh, even type 2 diabetes uh, people, when their sugar levels or glucose levels fluctuate and they need medication right away uh, to, to, to bring their, their sugar levels down, uh, you know, uh, all of this is really significant um, um, pre prescription wise. Now, there's something called a prescription watch that AARP is a part of. What, what can you share more about that? Yeah, so that's actually a series of reports that AARP has been publishing for almost 20 years at this point. Um, it's called the RX Price Watch Report, and I am one of the co authors. And what we do is track the prices of prescription drugs that are widely used by older Americans. And so we take a look at brand name drugs, we look at specialty drugs, those drugs that really have those high price tags you probably see in the news a lot, and then generic prescription drugs. And what we found with the trends that we've seen over time, again, we've been doing this for quite a while now, is that those brand name drug prices and specialty drug prices are consistently increasing year after year, often at rates that greatly exceed inflation, and that generic prices typically decrease. And these reports really have been incredibly important, one, to point out the challenges in prescription drug pricing and how they are affecting AARP's members, but they've also been a great tool in our advocacy because they are widely cited both by members of Congress and state policymakers when it comes to advocating for change. So they've been a really important tool for AARP for quite a while now. I'm glad you mentioned that. And a lot of times uh, when we're reading the Inflation Reduction Act, much of it focuses on Part D, as you mentioned, Part D in dog. So why the emphasis on Part D? So Medicare Part D is incredibly important. Um, a lot of people don't know that Medicare did not have a part of the benefit that covered prescription drugs you picked up at the pharmacy. And the law that created it wasn't until 2003 and Part D plans weren't available until 2006. So this is a relatively new part of the program. And it also happens to cover a lot of prescription drugs. It's all prescription drugs that aren't covered under Medicare Part B as in boy, which again are those kind of special drugs that you receive while you're at the doctor's office. So these are the drugs that people are taking very consistently. And so there's been a lot of challenges um, for in terms of affordability, whether you're talking as someone who's enrolled in Medicare Part D or the government and taxpayer spending on Medicare Part D because they pick up part of the tab as well. And so there's been a lot of interest in trying to reform Medicare Part D and also make it possible for Part D to bring down prescription drug prices to, to effectively reduce the amount that it's spending on the products that it's covering. And so a lot of the uh, provisions within the Inflation Reduction Act are helping Medicare Part D. And I mentioned those penalties for drug companies that increase their prices faster than inflation, but we also have a lot of other provisions that are starting soon that also affect Medicare Part D. So for example, starting next year, vaccines that are recommended by ACIP, which is part of the Center for Diseases Control, it's really those important vaccines, are going to be available for free under Medicare Part D, even before you meet the deductible. So like your shingle shot free. will be free starting next year. Another really important one going back to insulin starting next year is that monthly insulin co-pays will be capped at $35 for Medicare beneficiaries, even before they meet their deductible. So that's helping the cost at the pharmacy counter even before we start talking about the price. And that's been really important as well. And then there are also a lot of big changes coming to the Medicare Part D benefit itself. Um, Medicare Part D has catastrophic coverage. And when you reach that part of the benefit, you're still responsible for part of your costs. And there are some people who are having to pay between 10 and $15,000 per year for their cost sharing, for their out-of-pocket costs. And so starting in 2024, that share of their costs, that 5% that they pay in catastrophic is going away. And there is also going to be limitations on how much Part D premiums can increase for mm. a certain period of time. Okay. And then another really important thing, I could go on all day, obviously. Another really important thing starting in 2025 is that there is finally going to be a hard out-of-pocket cap under Medicare Part D, it's gonna be $2,000 in 2025. So that means those people that I mentioned who are spending 10 or $15,000 per year will now be limited to $2,000 per year. And that is a huge Marvelous. savings Marvelous. for a lot of people. And also just a protection for people maybe who don't have high spending today, but could be facing it in the future. 
So what is so important about the ability to negotiate? Uh, I often hear that term when uh, news reports come out about uh, the ability to negotiate with prescription, prescription drug companies. So for a very long time, I, I think I mentioned Medicare is was not able to negotiate with drug companies. There was some negotiation taking place within the benefit um, because those individual Medicare Part D plans where people are covered were negotiating on behalf of the people in their plans. But there is economies of scale at play. And so when you talk about an individual Medicare Part D plan, they're just not going to have the same negotiating power as Medicare negotiating on behalf of all 50 million people who are enrolled in Medicare Part D. So this change is incredibly important because Medicare will bring a lot of clout to the negotiating table um, and hopefully be able to get a pretty good deal on the prescription drugs that it covers. And that, of course, will translate to lower costs for the people who are taking those drugs. So it really represents a massive change and a really big improvement for the people who are in the program. That's marvelous. I'm, I'm so excited to hear about these major changes. And, and it's really significant because if you're talking about a cap where people uh, are, are capped at, two, at putting out $2,000 in out-of-pocket expenses versus $10,000 in out-of-pocket expenses, that's, that's huge. It absolutely is. And we always like to remind people when we're pushing for changes of, of this magnitude, um, the median annual income for Medicare beneficiaries is just around $30,000 per year. So this is a meaningful impact for people who really were facing some affordability challenges, especially those who are facing spending half of what they're making in a year just on these prescription drugs. So this new cap is really important and will help a lot, in fact, millions of people. Well, I anticipate that too, because um, even I'm thinking oftentimes some seniors are, are trying to decide affordability wise, can I afford to take my medicine today or skip a pill or skip something uh, simply because I can't afford it and uh, based on the income that I have right now. So it seems like the inflation reduction uh, act is helping in that regard. Absolutely. Um, the number of provisions that are in there that will help bring down people's just monthly costs that are related to prescription drugs are hugely important because we have heard from a lot of our members and older Americans generally who are really having to make those tough choices between paying for the prescription drugs that they need and paying for other important things like their food or their rent. And our perspective has always been that no one should have to make those choices. And our hope is that the Inflation Reduction Act will make it where a lot fewer people are having to make those tough decisions. Excellent. Excellent point here. Now, a lot of people don't uh, necessarily know the difference between Part A, Part B, and Part D of Medicare. Share a little bit about that for us, please. Yeah, it truly is what I like to call an alphabet soup of coverage. Um, generally speaking, the different parts of Medicare help cover specific types of services. And as you mentioned, there's A, B, C, and D. So Part A is for inpatient and hospital coverage. So when it's kind of an acute care situation. Part B is in boy is for outpatient medical coverage. So things like doctor's visits. Part D is in dog is for those outpatient prescription drugs. Again, those drugs that you pick up at the pharmacy. And then part C is for private plans that typically cover part A, part B, and part D services. And what that is is kind of a managed care that's similar to what some people may have gotten from their employer in the past. And the even more complicated part of it is that each of those parts of Medicare comes with different costs. So like premiums and deductibles and cost sharing. And it is admittedly incredibly complicated. So I did want to make a plug for AERP's new Medicare Q&A tool, which has a ton of information about what's covered, who's eligible, how to enroll, how much Medicare costs, because we fully appreciate how challenging it is to figure out Medicare. I, I know that a lot of people uh, who are just not thinking about retirement now, but they might be, uh, especially people maybe in their 50s, they are thinking about retirement. And uh, they tend to uh, uh, get lost in whether or not uh, they're going to need Medicare if they have a pension. And um, there are some employers, for example, 
uh, municipal employees or, or persons that are part of a pension plan, isn't some of their medical coverage part of A and B or how does that work for them? And they don't have to pick up D. How does that work for some? So it's a, this is a really important question because Medicare does have late enrollment penalties. Um, so if you don't enroll in Medicare when you're originally supposed to, you can face higher premiums for a certain period of time or even for every month that you have Medicare coverage. So your first chance to sign up is when you turn 65, and that is what is called your initial enrollment period. And that lasts for seven months. It starts three months before you turn 65 and ends three months after the month you turn 65. And there are also certain situations where you can enroll without having to worry about those late enrollment penalties. Um, so for example, if you or your spouse have group health plan coverage through your job and are still working, you don't have to enroll in Part A or Part B. Um, you also will have a period of time after which, for example, you or your spouse stop working or you lose that group health coverage. And that also will give you the ability to enroll in Medicare without facing a late enrollment penalty. Um, it is complicated. And I, if I could go back to that Q&A tool that AARP has on its website, that is definitely a place to look if you have questions about this, because there are definite set periods when you do have to think about when you're going to enroll and under what circumstances potentially you could put it off. Well, you know, the, you mentioned again the website and the Q&A tool. So if um, we are actually scrolling www.aarp.org uh, on our television broadcast, and if we went to that website, what would we put in the search engine to get to that Q&A tool? I think Medicare Q&A tool will get you there the fast. Medicare, mm -hmm. to, okay, Q&A, okay, right. tool would get us to that specific um, uh, area where we need. It would, uh, and, and again, there's a ton of information about really any question you could potentially ask. So I highly recommend it. I recommend it to my family members. Um, it's definitely a very helpful tool. That's good. Now, one other important aspect of Part D of the Medicare plan has to do with um, the, uh, the this discussion of the donut hole. What is the donut hole? So the donut hole is actually a part, a very notorious part of the Medicare Part D benefit when it was originally created, where enrollees who had a certain amount of prescription drug spending would be responsible for 100% of their prescription drug costs until their out of pocket reached a certain threshold that would put them into the catastrophic coverage. Um, the donut hole actually technically started to close as part of the Affordable Care Act through a series of escalating discounts from drug companies and Medicare. And technically, I'm saying technically, it closed a few years ago. Um, but we know that some people were still facing substantially higher costs when they reached that part of the benefit because their Part D plan was switching them, for example, from a flat copayment to paying a percentage of their drug costs. And so we know some people were still experiencing some challenges when it came to that part of the benefit. But here's the really good news. Um, the donut hole as part of the Inflation Reduction Act is actually going to go away forever. It will no longer be a part of the benefit as of 2025. Um, and that's again, important because that same year is when that new hard of, out of pocket limit will be created. So that's part of those important changes coming to Medicare Part D. Uh, but the important takeaway is that the coverage gap or the donut hole is officially gone. Wonderful. And so by 2025, we don't have to worry about the donut hole uh, at all. That is correct. It will not be a part of anyone's discussions ever again as of 2025. How responsive were AARP members to getting the inflation Reduction Act passed. AARP's members, and I cannot overstate this, played an enormous role in getting the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, we had thousands of volunteers and AARP members who across the country were calling and emailing and texting um, and urging their lawmakers to support the Inflation Reduction Act. We had more than 4 million Americans signing positions that urged Congress to act. Um, if, if nothing else, it really made it very clear of how important this issue is to our members. And they definitely showed up and had a huge impact on the passage of this legislation. Wonderful. I was one of those people. I read the materials from the AARP. I was diligently on the phone with my senators and 
and saying, make sure. <laughs> Thank you so much. It, it clearly yeah, it paid yeah. off. <laughs> and it, you know, it, you know, the significant work uh, that you, that uh, you all, uh, the AARP does in terms of its newsletters, it's, you know, it's not thrown away. People do read those AARP newsletters that you send out monthly and uh, share with us uh, and, and the letters that you send us, the, the, you know, even if it's a, a letter to notify your senator or your congressman about uh, significant legislation that impacts you, it's like, wake up. You, you need to be on this. You need to be paying attention to this. And uh, that's important. You know, absolutely so, is. And it's so, so good to what, hear you say that because we wouldn't be who we are and be able to do what we do without members like you engaging the way that you have. Um, you really are the power behind this organization. And I can't tell you how much we appreciate your efforts and your engagement. So what should people, uh, when should people again apply for Medicare without penalty? I want to make sure my listeners are, are, are clear on this part. Okay, so like everything else with Medicare, it's going to depend <laughs> on your part, um, what part you're talking about. Um, so most people uh, don't have to worry about Medicare Part A, so the hospital coverage. Most people don't have to pay a premium for Medicare Part A. So there's not really as much of a concern about a late enrollment penalty. But if you are someone who does have to pay that premium, your monthly premium could go up by 10% for as long as the number of years that you didn't sign up or twice the number, excuse me, twice the number of years that you didn't sign up. So something to keep an eye on, but again, the vast majority of people who are listening to this or watching this um, don't necessarily have to worry about that. Uh, yeah. Under Medicare Part B, you have to pay an extra 10% for every year you could have joined, but didn't. And under Medicare Part D, you have to pay an extra 1% for each month you didn't join. Um, or if you go for 63 days or more without what is known as creditable coverage, which is a fancy way of saying coverage that's equal to or better than Medicare Part D. So your first chance to sign up is that seven month period around when you turn 65. And if you're one of those people who still has employer sponsored coverage, whether it's from you or your spouse, you will get a special enrollment period once that coverage ends. And that is when you should enroll. But there are a lot of nuances in there. So again, I would go back to that Q&A tool that I mentioned, um, because there are some circumstances where you want to be sure you understand um, exactly when you should be enrolling so you can avoid those late enrollment penalties. So usually if someone, for example, is three months before they turn 65 and they make sure they enroll in Medicare, they're safe. Absolutely. Yes. And so if, if they if they wait three months after they're 65, are they safe or not safe? That's still within that safe period. Four months after you turn 65, after the month that you turn 65 would be outside your initial enrollment You're period. Not and safe. that's when you, exactly. That's when you have to start uh, worrying about those late enrollment penalties. But again, if you have coverage from your employer and you're still working, um, that is not necessarily a concern for you. So again, it kind of depends on your individual circumstances. Now, we don't hear much about Part C. Why is that? I think that a lot of people know about Medicare Part C, but they know it as Medicare Advantage instead. Um, I think that's a, a phrase that more people are familiar with. And it is popular. Um, I think at some point in the relatively near future, we're going to reach a tipping point where more than half of Medicare beneficiaries are enrolled in a Medicare Advantage plan. So it's definitely something that's popular um, and more people are enrolling in it. And I think some of that is just, it's very familiar to people who have had coverage from an employer in the past. You have your managed care, so you have a network um, of providers that you can go to, which is different from traditional Medicare, um, where you can go to anyone who accepts Medicare. So there's some differences between the two, but Medicare Advantage is definitely a popular option. That's good to know that that, that uh, you have that uh, Part C that is becoming very popular. And uh, oftentimes I, I see in the AARP publications that come out monthly, you have uh, vendors or health insurance companies that, um, uh, that actually have Part C coverage. Yes, they there are, are. I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. So you, you have some vendors that, that, you know, have Part C coverage. Yes, there are a lot of 
private plans that provide Medicare Advantage. And there are a lot of options for people to choose from. Um, I'd say, I think it's close to 30 on average is how many people have available to them across the country. So there are definitely a lot of plans that are available for people who are interested in looking at a Medicare Advantage plan. What about supplemental insurance? We hear that term a lot. You do. <laughs> so the vast majority of people who are on Medicare have some form of what is known as supplemental coverage. Um, sometimes it can be through, for example, Medicaid, and other times people purchase a private plan um, that a lot of times is referred to as Medigap. And it's called that because Medicare doesn't cover everything, and these supplemental plans can help fill in the gaps. Um, for what isn't paid for through Medicare. So it'll help cover some of that cost sharing or the deductibles. And a lot of people have chosen to have something like that because it gives them more comprehensive coverage and makes their costs when they do use services less. That's great. That's really great. And uh, th then there's... Um... Uh, other portions of the website, other than the Q&A tool, uh, what other web uh, areas in the AARP website uh, should we be uh, considering uh, to, to take a look at? That is a really big question. Um, our website covers a lot of ground. Um, if you are interested in looking at what AARP is advocating for, there's a section of the website for that. Um, if you're interested in learning about Medicare. There's a section of the website for that. Uh, we are consistently producing articles about topics of interest. If you're just interested in current events and whether AARP was involved, there's a part of the website for that. Um, we really do have an incredible amount of information available on AARP.org. So it's mostly a matter of what you're interested in, but there's a pretty good chance that we have something on whatever you would like to learn more about. You know, I just uh, uh, understand, I also understand that uh, another portion of AARP's website has Medicare um, uh, specific information for, for people who have reached that age in their 60s. And um, many times there are people who work for a private employer all their life and they've never worked for a government employer. How would their um, uh, Medicare plan be different from, let's say, the person that uh, is employed by the government? It would actually be the same. Uh, Medicare is Medicare. So if you are qualified and eligible and enrolled, what you experience in Medicare will be the same as what everybody else experiences. Um, the only real question I would say if you're if you have a private or a public employer um, is when you would enroll. So as long as you continue working, the same rules apply to you regardless of your type of employer. If you have that group health plan coverage and are still working, you don't have to enroll in Medicare Part A and Part B. Um, but as far as what Americans experience, regardless of your background, when you enroll in Medicare, you will have the same type of coverage as absolutely everyone else. Now, what about the people who decide, I'm going to work until I'm 70, 75, I'm going to work till I'm 80. In fact, um, uh, I, I distinctly remember that uh, there was uh, an employee who was an attorney that adjudicated cases uh, before me as an administrative law judge that was 90. <laughs> now, do these, because they, because they are, um, still working how how you know and they're probably still you know eligible for health benefits how does medicare work in that particular situation so you can go ahead and enroll in medicare um, at any time once you reach your eligibility age but as long as you have that coverage through your employer and are still working technically you don't have to enroll in medicare um, you just have to make sure that you have that coverage and it's still you know at least when it comes to, for example, prescription drugs, it's creditable coverage. So it's similar to what you would have gotten under Medicare Part D, which most private coverage does. Um, you really don't have to worry about enrolling in Medicare. That is good to know. That is really good <laughs> to know. And I thank you so much, Ms. Purvis. You have been so helpful in, in sharing with us a lot of information uh, that uh, we really uh, didn't uh, know about in this Inflation Reduction Act and unpacking it for us. Thank you ever so much for participating on our program today. 
It was a joy having you. Thank you so much for having me.